Okay, so this is the uh, final exam study guide for social problems. Okay, so the first one is just what primary sex characteristics are versus secondary sex characteristics. Primary sex characteristics are differences that we have in genitalia when we're born, while secondary sex characteristics are those characteristics we develop in puberty once we hit those kind of hormonal changes. Um, this idea of sex as a cultural issue means that our, the way that we engage in sexual activity is guided by our culture. So the norms of our culture will say what is appropriate sexual acts and what isn't, and who is appropriate to have sex with and who isn't. Um, Kinsey's research in the 40s and 50s, just the idea that it, it understood sexual expression on a scale. Instead of saying, are you heterosexual, are you homosexual? It looked at this idea of people on a six-pointed scale, and most people fell somewhere in the middle. Um, let's see, feminist movement in the 1970s, all I'm looking for there is just the kind of, um, their relationship to understandings of sexuality, such as looking at sex as a power dominance issue between men and women, um, you know, seeing sexism as a, as a social issue that should be addressed. And so, of course, because of that, they made public stands against incest, rape, pornography, and demanded, um, that women have access to birth control and abortion so that they could have control over their own reproductive lives. Um, sexual orientation is just an individual's romantic or emotional attraction to another person. Um, sexual identity versus gender identity. So the idea that your internal sense of your sexuality, meaning who you are attracted to sexually, is your sexual identity. Your gender identity is your internalized sense of whether you consider yourself to be male to be female or non-binary. Um, let's see, hostility and prejudice. Just that is the answer. Hostility and prejudice still exist. So in, the, in one um, of the slides, it goes through all of those kind of things. So it's just going to be some stuff from that. Um, the gay rights movement. Just the idea that before the gay rights movement, homophobia um, wasn't a word, right? It was just a normal expression of vitriolic hate towards a marginalized group of people. Um, let's see. Transgender is just uh, someone who appears or behaves in ways that challenge our expectations of gender performance. Um, sexual harassment is unwanted comments, gestures, or physical contact of a sexual nature. Um, teenage pregnancy, just the idea that the rate of teenage pregnancy in the U.S. is dropping, but it's still much higher than other developed countries. Um, and then when it comes to poverty, teens that have children while they are already poor are more likely to stay in poverty. All righty, let's see here, chapter 60. Okay, so why is sociology talking about the environment? It's because they're trying to understand how the environment is related to how people organize their lives in society. Um, let's see, so as far as the solid waste one, I'm just going to ask you a question there about you know, kind of, if you go back to that slide and review the stuff on the slide, you'll be fine. So just how we make a lot of stuff that's disposable because we want it to be convenient, but we don't think about the after effects of what happens, like something taking over a thousand years of decomposing a landfill. Um, so this idea that our comfort is more important than preserving the earth that we live on, that's what I'm looking for there. All right, water pollution, um, you know, just the kind of people that are affected by water pollution, meaning that, you know, there's water pollution in the form of people who get infectious diseases in countries where people don't have access to clean water sources, um, that often can happen in our own country is going on right now. A lot of water contamination through fracking, um, or hydraulic fracturing where, um, you know, a lot of chemicals are put in to break up. Um, this fractured earth and that often makes its way into the groundwater. Also what we talked about with farmlands um, washing into the ocean and creating dead zones, how there's more and more of us that need water so water is a problem of just accessing it. So anyway those kind of things is what I'm looking for there. Um, acid rain is a global issue just meaning that um, the air doesn't stay in one area. <laughs> so if there's pollution in one area and um, this pollution can flow to other areas, um, that the destruction that's caused by acid rain may happen in areas that aren't where the pollution is emanating from. 
right? Like in the Northeast. Um, disappearing rainforest. So why are we cutting down the rainforest? Um, oftentimes we're cutting it down for grazing land for cattle, which is a completely ridiculous reason to cut down the forest. It's like, uh, try imagining, like explaining that to a little kid, right? Like, well, why are we cutting down the rainforest? We know that this is a problem. Why are we doing it? Oh, because people want to eat cows. So we have to somehow use the rainforest as grazing lands which is insane. Also for exotic hardwoods, right? So people can, you know, redecorate their house or whatever. Um, the impact on plant and animal biodiversity, just the idea like once it's gone, it's not coming back. And these things are so inter interrelated webs of animals that all rely upon each other within an ecosystem. You take out a couple elements of that ecosystem and the ecosystem itself falls apart. Um, problems related to the decline in biodiversity. So meaning that, you know, um, we could be often losing um, plants and, you know, of course, animal species as well. But, you know, a lot of the research that goes into like the pharmacological invention of, you know, medicines that help us cure diseases that plague humankind often come from plant sources um, from a lot of these areas. So if you basically destroy whole ecosystems, you might be destroying the cure for cancer. Um, okay, so how does structural functionalism look at this? How does social conflict look at this? So structural functionalism is really looking at how technology and culture impact the state of the environment, while social conflict is looking at how elites make environmental problems worse because they're trying to make money in the short term and not thinking about the economic and social costs of environmental destruction in the long term. Because I mean, economically, yes. D does it make more money for oil industries to go in and drill in the Arctic right now? Yeah, they would make more money in the short term, right? But in the long term, the kind of financial devastation that comes as a result of environmental c catastrophes is actually much more expensive <laughs> than any of the kind of net short-term benefit that companies could find. Alrighty, um, environmental racism. This is just a pattern of discrimination where environmental hazards are greatest for poor people, especially minorities. And, you know, kind of going back to that, that pig farming video I put up for you guys, that kind of thing, um, that it's predominantly low income people of color that are more likely to live next to landfills or coal mines or things of that nature where um, you're going to face pollution. Alrighty, chapter 15. Okay, so demography. It's just the study of the human population, right? All that fun, statistical fun stuff. Um, infant mortality is the number of deaths among children at least one year of age for every thousand live births. It's just a measure of, you know, um, demography. Um, let's see. The low growth north um, is basically this idea that, that um, there's what they call the low growth north and the high growth south. So the north, um, the northern hemisphere tends to be more... Um, developed through colonialism. They were the countries that conquered the South pretty much. So um, the North has gone through industrialization. So because of that, basically they have very low population growths, right? We talked about this, like it doesn't make sense to have 12 kids in a country where you have to pay a bunch of money to have 12 kids. So, um, you know, because of this people um, have they also have access to contraception and abortion. So they have less children. More of them stay single um, because of the constraints of the workforce. More of them just, you know, work without getting married. So there's very few people kind of coming in uh, population wise in the North versus the high growth South where people don't off, often don't have access to contraceptives. Women often live in very patriarchal societies that they don't have control over their bodies and no access to abortion. Um, also, you know, a lot of people are still living in more of like a subsistence kind of situation where basically like people are still living in more um, pre-industrialized ways, but they now have access to better medicines. So people are like living longer there because they have more medical access and um, but they're still not restricting birth by contraceptives, abortion, or just, you know, choice, basically. So you have like a lot more people population wise, because people are living longer. And the amount of people being born is still pretty high. All right, so Malthusian theories that kind of like, you know, uh, the sky is falling, we're all gonna die kind of thing, right? This idea that 
people are going to reproduce beyond what the planet can feed. So, you know, he, Malthusian had this point, and of course this is like in the very early era of industrialization, where he saw this kind of exponential growth of people, meaning that he said that, that crops are arithmetic and, and people are exponential, meaning that, you know, plants, you plant so many plants, you're going to get a certain amount of harvest, right? You can't really make that happen any more than it does. Versus like people, if, you know, someone has a couple, has 12 children, and those 12 children, they themselves couple up and have 12 children. It's this idea that the human population is growing at a much faster rate than the food supply would be able to sustain. Um, but again, he was developing that theory in a time period where there was already a kind of an economic change going on. So it's not as accepted as, as um, you know, nowadays there's demographic transition theory that really argues that technological development is what controls population. So we talked about the different stages of development and all that stuff in the slide, just how if you're pre-industrial, industrial, post-industrial, post like how the population changes as a result of having more access to, um, you know, technology and contraceptives. All right. Um, world's poverty problem. So there's about 850 million people in the world who don't have enough to eat. So that's a huge problem because a lot of those people are children. Um, and again, not for um, fault of their own, but just because of their social or economic locations. Um, relative poverty versus absolute poverty. So relative poverty is not having resources that most take for granted in society. So that would be like if you live in our culture and you don't have a car or you don't have a cell phone, right? That would be relative poverty, right? Where you're like, well, I can't afford to pay the six or $700 for the phone and the whatever it is, like 100 bucks a month, depending on your plan, to maintain it, um, that would be considered relative poverty, right? Absolute poverty is considered where you lack resources that are life-threatening, meaning you can't get access to food, water, shelter, clothing, things like that. So um, we talked about that a little bit in class, the kind of difference between them and how oftentimes people that fault the poor or victim blame the poor um, do so with this relative poverty versus absolute poverty scope where they say, well, they're not starving to death, so are they really poor? But um, answer is yes, they are. All right, so when it comes to poverty in children, um, in a lot of low-income countries, um, children are not getting um, the proper nutrition that they need because of their impoverished status. That has a lot of health consequences for kids, right? Um, when it comes to poverty in women, um, women are, are at a higher risk of poverty than men and comprise 70% of adults who face absolute poverty. All righty. Um, let's see here. So slavery, what I'm looking for there is just different kinds of slavery. We talked about the different kinds, the shadow slavery, this idea of like, like a person owning another person. Um, we talked about debt bondage. We talked about state-imposed slavery, like um, working on a chain gang or like making license plates you know, that kind of stereotypical representation, but just the idea that um, under the 13th Amendment, there's still an exception. It, like, it outlaws slavery in the United States, but it says that slavery can be used as a punishment for a crime. So if you're a criminal, you can still be enslaved. Um, and then child slavery, which is just a kind of slavery that's characterized by servile forms of marriage, where People often as, as young as 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 are married off to um, older men. And the assumption there is that they will be completely dependent and, you know, perform all of these kind of things for them, um, which is its own form of slavery. All right. Modernization theory is just a model of economic and social development that argues that, you know, basically the technological and cultural differences between societies reflect the global inequality that's there. Um, world systems is the one we talked about, how it kind of looks at the global inequality in terms of like historical colonial relationships, meaning that world system says, okay, there's the, the countries that are the strongest that have the most power, what they call the core countries, are ones that through the process of colonialism um, basically stole resources from other countries and that's why they're rich. Um, so colonialism, the definition of that is what I'm looking for there, just the def definition from your book, the process by which some nations enrich themselves through political and economic control of other countries. 
Um, Neocolonialism is a form of this where it's not about the government doing it as much as it's through multinational corporations. Um, let's see. Wallerstein had the um, this kind of world systems argument where he was saying that, you know, high income countries are the core of the world. Um, low income countries are the periphery and the results are the semi periphery. Um, dependency theory is just, again, from your book, um, this idea that the world economy exploits people living in poor nations and makes low income countries dependent on rich nations. And I started getting into that a little bit with, you know, the IMF, World Bank kind of stuff for those things. Um, and then as far as the world's increasing economic inequality, meaning that the gap between the rich and poor is increasing, though a lot of people have a better sense of, of um, people are better off in general because of technology, because of medicine, because of things like that. People have more resources, so people tend to be living longer and tend to be having um, you know better living standards than their parents or grandparents' generations. But at the same time, while that's happening, the gap between the people that have money and don't is ever increasing. Okay, so then as far as the essay questions um, in regards to the film, in what ways has human activity come to harm the ocean? So there, you don't have to list like everything they talk about in the film, but give me one example, right? One example of how that was. Is it through the trash? Is it through deep sixing things? Is it through um, the farmlands washing out and causing dead zones? Is it through, you know, overfishing? Is it any of those things that they talked about? They talked about a ton of those things in the film. Um, and then the second part, why does Dr. Sylvia Earle argue um, what, sorry, what does Dr. Sylvia Earle argue will happen to human life if the ocean continues to die? Um, that we, we will all die, right? When the majority of the oxygen in the planet comes from the ocean, if the ocean is toxic and dies, so do we. Um, so we are connected to, like the fate of the ocean is connected to the fate of humanity. Um, what does Malthusian theory argue about the population in the future, right? We talked about this quite a bit. Um, this idea that like people exponential, um, plants are arithmetic and, uh, what does demographic transition theory argue? Meaning that the more that, and again, those different stages of transition, pre-industrial, industrial, post-industrial, post how, um, so that's what I'm looking for there and to fully explain it. Not just like this one says that this, this one says that, that I want you to explain Malthusian theory. He's arguing that people will outgrow the pace of food and will starve and die or fight for resources. Demographic is looking more at the stages of development. So briefly mention those stages. And, um, you know, then at the end of that, which do you agree with and why? So I'm looking for, you know, to get full points on that, you have to answer every part of that question. All right. So this is the study guide review. Hopefully this helps.